So I'm going to step into monitoring manage and management. We've got uh, compost going on, bends or windrows are some things that we want to look out for. Um, Generally speaking, we were really seeing a lot of results in the three or four month to six month range. All right, but depending on different sites, management situations, uh, reading some of the literature out there, and even anecdotal stories, um, we found in some cases, especially in the northern part of the semi arid west, it might take up to 12 months in a passive uh, situation. Um, but generally speaking, we leave this alone uh, for four to six months, but we do monitor to make sure we are making some progress. Um, most of the soft tissue is gone in six to eight weeks. Um, a lot of this is a result of uh, the heat as well as the microbial digestion of the material. Optimum temperature is uh, right here in this 120 to 150 degree range. Um, you start getting above that, you'll actually see some scorching uh, inside the pile when you cut into it later. When you start uh, getting below 120, you're less efficient. And when you're below 80 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, pretty darn poor performance. You're obviously not maintaining the microbial population you want for this, uh, you know, the thermophilic population of bacteria and fungi and such. Check temperature with the probe thermometer. A simple um, dial probe thermometer runs anywhere from 30 or 40 bucks up to about 80 bucks in different ag supply catalogs. Um, for the sake of some research, demonstrated research, um, we were using an electronic probe and a data logger, um, but uh, just simple management of manure composting or these mortalities, 40 or 50 bucks will get you adequate piece of uh, instrumentation. Um, Michael, I think, was alluding to this slide, which demonstrates on our mortality compost um, situation up at Haver demonstrated research and uh, we built these piles mid to late February. All right, we uh, discovered the mortalities. It was during calving season up in northern Montana and uh, got them put in some warm material. The carcasses were not frozen yet, but ambient temperature here was down in the low single digits, 18 inches and 36 inches of depth from the exterior of the pile. We were well above 130 degrees. Fahrenheit for multiple days. Uh, that red line there represents a key margin for killing most pathogens that we'd be concerned about. So quite productive. Um, we do see some odd behavior every once in a while. You might find a, a cold spot. And you have to remember you've got a big, wet, proteiny thing, you know, a thousand pounds, right? And it's enveloped in carbon material, but you'll have some pockets of anaerobic breakdown and rotting, some pockets that will be too wet, but over the long term, overall, this remains an aerobic process. Um, so we would see some temperature drops here or there, uh, but overall, looking at some average readings, you know, we're hitting our benchmark temperatures. Um, we had a parallel demonstration on feedlot manure composting, and it was during that study where we had a spell a few days at negative 20. And we were still at well over 100 degrees in the core of that compost pile, and it was negative 20 at the time. So, moisture is important. We've touched on um, that overall 50 to 60 percent range. Uh, we were using some manure solids and some spoiled silage, and they are all those materials were already microbially active and at about that 50 to 60 percent range. And so, when we built our piles, uh, we did not. Uh, add any additional water at that time. We did later on in the summer when we did some turning and curing. Other issues to keep an eye out, keeping along with this management and monitoring theme, um, make sure that that cap stays in place, continue to act as a biofilter. Um, you know, preventing odors is good for neighbor relations. Uh, it's good for not attracting um, scavengers. Um, and Several of our sites, we had the farm dogs, known packs of coyotes. Um, there was no disturbance from those sorts of animals. Even the rodents and birds were not that interested. Um, we did have a handful of ranchers near Fairfield, Montana, on the Rocky Mountain front and up against the Bob Marshall Wilderness area, who uh, their main predator concern coming down into the ranch were grizzly bears. Um, 
they were not quite ready to adopt this uh, management practice yet. Let's see. Excessive flies, often this is a function of uh, the leachate and some sort of, you know, habitat uh, that would be generated for those sorts of nuisance insects. Um, we're pretty darn dry, you know, in the context of where we did all these demonstrations. Um, and we were well managed with the right amount of carbon, so we didn't really have that habitat. Scavenger activity, this is all related back to that proper cover. Um, yeah, just a reminder, drive the point home with the little bit of humor there. All right. Um, this isn't rocket science um, or brain surgery. Every site I tell producers, you know, we've got these general recommendations. If you look at this presentation, there's a whole lot of ranges given. Um, so on-site trial and error. As extension educators, extension specialists, NRCS or conservation district staff, go out there and, you know, you can work with your producers on this. There's going to be on-site trial and error. So um, sort of see how it works with the material you have access to, that producer's management commitment, and uh, we'll sort of see you know, how, how that process, how this recommendation practice is going to work with them. Uh, generally speaking, though, when you follow our general recommendations, um, all the soft tissue is gone, um, especially by that six-month mark. Maybe some large bones. Uh, usually they're brittle. We filter those out in two of our, our sites that uh, we work with in Montana. Filter them out before we do some limited land application on the source operations. Um, I'm starting to mention curing, and uh, we'll get into that a little more. It's just after that initial phase where we're digesting all of that soft tissue, um, the process slows down. It's harder to hold our, our temperatures where we want them. We'll turn that material into semi-arid west. We often have to add water back at that point. Uh, then we're starting to move more into the traditional composting arena, but it allows us to finish up that material a little bit more. All right, so here's an example. This was at a June field day where um, many of the project colleagues were able to come on up to Montana. And uh, this is uh, about an 1,100 pound cow that was put in in late February. This field day was early June. Um, we have some bones left, a tiny bit of hide, and some connective tissue, stromal proteins, uh, tendons, that sort of thing. But you know, this is really at about the three and a half month mark uh, in mortality, 1,100 pound mortality that went in in very cold temperatures. So we covered her back up after the field day. Um, there was there was no odor there. I mean, we had. Guests, ag producers, high school science students, FFA students, DEQ staff, all sorts of stuff at this field day at the experiment station. No odor, no complaints. There really weren't any flies out. Um, and there are flies in Montana in June, you know, summer. But uh, we covered it up, uh, dealt with it again in another four months in the summer, early fall. It was done. Great stuff. So this curing is a period of warm but not hot composting, the microbial action tapers off, the, uh, the pile becomes more isothermic and, and even throughout. We lose that stratified uh, temperature with the heat at the center. And um, generally speaking, we are not making the recommendation as a team to go out and give these to um, use this material for export or sale. If there's another compost you know, business or enterprise associated with the ag operation. We're generally putting this mortality compost product back into composting more mortalities or selective land application on the farmer ranch of origin. Site selection. Uh, sort of skipped over this with some of the other details, but much like we store manure stockpiles or anything else, uh, site selection starts out with the goal of protecting water quality, soil quality. You know, so we want a site that's going to be up high, uh, that's not going to receive a lot of a run on, um, maybe necessary to do some contour, ditching, or berming to prevent that. Um, we want to control any leachate or run off. Now, in semi arid west, we rarely see that. We're really fighting to keep the minimum moisture in these piles for active composting. Um, 
may consider location relative to neighboring properties, visual screening from roads or highways, uh, that sort of public perception issue is, is a concern. But these are some attributes of um, good site, uh, out of floodplain, et cetera. Now, key deal uh, here is, I mean, think about it, Murphy's Law, when are you going to see mortality, unexpected, you know, mortalities? The worst weather, middle of calving in the mud or rain or snow or what have you. So these sites need to have pretty good all year, all weather access. Uh, we also recommend windrows or bends that you have. Uh, you have some started and prepped come into these time periods where you know you might experience some mortality, especially if you have a really tight seasonal calving or lambing interval. So you should just bring those mortalities when they're discovered, put them right on a base that's already there and you've got your other carbon stock, go ahead and cover them up. So um, yeah, convenient for material handling, that all weather access, you know, it can't be a nice pad that can't get heated during the month or something like that. Probably three months. Well drained, uh, in many cases, and around the country, I've seen different different requirements or recommendations. Um, in any of our sites, we did not have really engineered pads. In most of the case, we had decent separation from groundwater. We had some decent clay soils. Um, they're already pretty dry. Lots of carbon material to manage the leachate. So we were not on concrete pads or other you know, geotech or engineered pads for this practice. You might need to do some basic grading to prevent uh, pooling or ponding in the weeding area. Um, and then in some cases, especially some of the NRCS recommendations, they might actually say that you need some stormwater retention. And maybe we get into the Midwest and start crossing out of the humid, out of the arid plains into the humid plains. Um, this stormwater issue becomes more important. But at any rate, check your local regulations for. Uh, Issues of depth of groundwater, perhaps, with this practice, um, and then stormwater management as well. Pretty simple. Uh, we've alluded to this in previous slides. Keep clean water clean, you know, one of the tenets of, of manure management, and then manage or control uh, any of the, the wastewater. Uh, in our climate, the direct train and snowfall is very beneficial to just tweaking by and maintaining that moisture content primary three to six month period. Um, grass filter strips actually are pretty darn ideal over having to dig another hole or engineer another sort of pond. Um, just in our climate, we just don't see the need for filter strips ideal. There's a little bit of backup and peace of mind. One thing that's uh, pretty beneficial for this, uh, this sort of practice, uh, certainly with larger conventional operations, but all the way down to some of the hobby scale, uh, small enterprise folks, is doesn't take much equipment. You don't have to have a backhoe uh, or some sort of big piece of machinery to dig these holes. You do a lot of this with a small loader. Uh, the biggest thing you have to deal with is dragging or pulling around a, a large cow or bull. On small properties, uh, folks can do a lot with some of their own small equipment, compact tractors and such. So. We've seen a lot of these managed with just a skid steer loader. So pretty simple. Um, since we're not really engaged in this type of situation in uh, commercial compost production, you know, we're not even employing uh, commercial terms or anything like that. We're really moving towards a very uh, consistent, consumer-ready compost product. Water source and hose. We had to bring a tank, truck-mounted tank, down there to irrigate our windrow. But Screen is optional, and here's an image. Um, the dairy goat producer that Michael mentioned in Montana just put this together with a little welder and some nuts and fat washers, expanded metal grating, um, angle iron frame, and so he filters out his compost that way, turns the big pieces back into the next pile, and uses that finish for more mortalities and some limited to depth on this farm. So. Um, Effective climate, I think that uh, through all the sites we visited, some basic demonstrated research we did with producers and communicating with our neighbors up in, say, Lethbridge, Canada, where they also did the same sorts of demonstrations. 
very feasible throughout the arid, warm and cold Rocky Mountain corridor and, and western end of the Great Plains. Um, in order to make it work in our climate, uh, proper moisture is one of the key issues. The active core material really helps us get a jump, especially in the cold weather. So that was something like silage, some manure solids, something where we already had good microbial activity. Getting to the carcasses and getting them put in before they were frozen, um, which was pretty, pretty quick, like you know, zero or negative 10 or negative 20. And then finally, uh, a proper cover serves a lot of important purposes, insulation, conserving heat, as well as the biofilter and, and odor benefits. Issues to watch out for. Uh, in the end, the more finished product, bones, we screen those out for the material that uh, we're going to land apply, throw them back in the next pile, they'll continue to break down. Um, for operational mortalities, I mentioned already, you know, consider having a windrow start ready, a bin ready to go during periods of time when you think you may be expecting mortality. Um, have a site ready to go, sort of plan ahead, plan accordingly. Regarding scavengers and odors, this is largely controlled by that quality cap of non-odor material. The nuisance, nuisance insects, um, often we saw this in a situation of too much moisture or leachate was not controlled. The neighbor relations, um, just very situational, very site specific, but you have to kind of consider the need to screen. And, you know, these general recommendations plus a little on site trial and error leads us to the point where we really don't see a lot of problems very beneficial to the producer in most cases. Um, I mentioned we we're sort of uncomfortable with being able to recommend or tell somebody, yeah, add this with your manure compost that you're selling commercially. Um, you know, don't recommend to export this material. Um, it's important um, to consider a veterinary consult if the animal died of a suspicious if it's a calving problem and you know that's what they died from, that's one thing. But if you think it might be a, a, a state declared or foreign animal disease run by a veterinarian, it's not going to be appropriate. Um, in an emergency situation, our state veterinarian, much like Colorado, said we're going to compost for foot and mouth disease, catastrophic one time. Um, it's the best option, and, and that's what they're going to do. But there could be other things. One of those areas that we were uncomfortable to really get into it was none of our expertise. Um, the issue of prions, uh, obviously with other controls on feed sources and whatnot and import bans and, and such, I think we're really out of a period of time where we're going to see um, the non-spontaneous um, BSE in cattle, right? But we do know we have other prion diseases that are active. Small ruminants, domestic small ruminants with scrapie. Um, certainly in Montana, I suspect Colorado chronic wasting disease and urine elk herd um, pops up and is an issue. So um, you might want to consider a veterinary consult with someone with that issue. Finally, uh, we think this fits well with, uh, say, the CNMP, emergency planning, all these uh, situations, plans, and such where you need to address mortality and catastrophic mortality. Um, both in permitted CAFOs and in our efforts to, to work with emergency management on uh, making plans. Uh, likewise, you need to consider how an emergency might impact your active mortality composting operation. Do you flood it out? Does a windstorm blow it away and then just be prepared to go ahead and mitigate that site and whatnot after a natural disaster? So, with that, um, I sort of got ahead of myself there, but uh, that sort of wraps up the process um, end of this. We're going to go into look at economics. Are there any questions here in the middle before we get going? Sir, are you stretching again or questions? <laughs> um, we've sort of crudely used the um, squeeze method, you know, of our source materials. Um, like, say, sawdust or manure solids or even the uh, silage I mentioned. It squeezes, it kind of makes a moist ball. It, it feels wet, but you're not expressing free water. Um, that's sort of the rule of thumb that we've been using, both in conventional, say, garden waste and 
for our composting and for our source materials here. Yeah, it sort of hangs together, it feels moist, but it's not dripping and you're not squeezing the water out. You're just sort of right at that barrier. Um, so you can use a glove or not. <laughs> yes, sir. So at um, our Haver Beef Experiment Station in Montana, where they've decided this, you know, beyond the demonstrator research, they're adopting this as their <coughs> management plan. Um, they have an area where they're moving the windrows back and forth um, in, a, in a general area. We're probably going to just look to go back and do some soil samples in about year three or four across this pad where the windrows are migrating. They turn and move uh, their windrows. So that has been a consideration. Um, we do see very little leaching past that coarse material base um, when you just inspect the piles visually and you're digging around in them and doing a demonstration. So, our Montana is 12 to 14 inches of creeps every year, though. So that's a uh, different situation. I certainly appreciate the, the need and recommendation. Not. Um, I've seen that recommendation and um, gave plenty of presentations before I left Georgia and, and, and recommended that. I don't know, is Gene still there? Do you have a comment or recommendation? Uh, lacerating the rumen or puncturing uh, large muscle, muscle groups. Yes, sir. Um, did you do? I, I know it, uh, the uh, Michael had mentioned the lower oxygen levels. Did you do the bin structure? Did you guys do any monitoring of oxygen? And your it looked like your 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 uh, test bin was the bales. Right. It was. We initially started with the the bales bin at Haver Experiment Station, but we have moved to windrows. Um, we had an oxygen probe on. Um, the device we were, we were using to also measure temperature. Um, unfortunately, we were not that well trained on the device and we didn't really trust our, our data. However, anecdotally, we really didn't see that the process was greatly inhibited um, by that you know, stack in surface on the sides. Um, obviously, it would, would inhibit flow over a pyramidal aisle or, or a windrow if that was. Barriers. We've done, we put in an ASP in their phase static pile system at Washington State University, and they were doing mortalities on one of the bays. Um, so I, you know, I was just wondering whether uh, much has been done. And you, you might know, or yourself, uh, you know, what came done. What has been done with uh, ASP very static piles with mortalities as opposed to just straight static piles? Uh, some people have tried to. They are getting leachate and having to collect it, but they're not having an odor problem, and it's working really well. Time for forced air composting goes way down, but you're you're looking at a six month time frame, so correct. Uh, not that much of a concern. Right. There was a municipality in Montana that was uh, 
using forced air um, with biosolids from the POTW and then mixing with their um, using garden waste. They got to where they were rushing the process too much. Um, even though they should have a benefit in time with the forced air, they were rushing too much and they started getting into some serious killing problems. They were drying things down too much. Yeah, and they've, I visited about five years ago, and they've, they've sort of switched from one problem to another with that system. Um, I believe Virginia DOT was doing some post They have some in there, and they have some in there, and they have some in there, So for the sake of the recording, I'll just mention that uh, off mic, we're having a bit of a discussion on evolution of condition air compost and uh, in addition, uh, addition to this little study. Any more sort of management questions before we, we get into economics and then our summary? Yes, ma'am. So one of your presenters had talked about stacking smaller carcasses. I'm just curious about the management of that. So if you have you know, your first layer stack and then two or three months later you have, say, three more animals died, do you put them on top? Do you mix that first and then Right, it would be in a shorter period of time. So the two examples would be um, calving losses uh, in northern Montana, where we might have had a couple on the bottom, and uh, you know what are we talking, eighty to one hundred ten pounds or something, and then you had that margin already at eighteen inches or so, and then a third calf went on top pyramid style, and then we closed off that bend. Other example was small ruminants at uh, the Mafia goat dairy, um, where they had um, a smaller compost bin, you know, probably over a period of two to three weeks during one of their, their heavy kidding intervals. Um, they had multiple layers in there. That's a much smaller unit as well. Um, but yeah, over a shorter period of time, anywhere from one week to a month. I take uh, one more and then I'd love to hand, hand it over.